Our next guest also signed the letter, and she oversees $2.3 trillion in client assets. Joining me right now is J.P. Morgan Asset Management CEO, Mary Callahan Erdos. Mary, great to see you. Thanks so much for joining us. Happy to be here. Good morning, Maria. So we're looking at this letter in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, uh, a number of other newspapers where you, at, where you and your colleagues outline a number of things that you'd like companies to adopt in order to change corporate governance. What are you trying to achieve? Well, you know, this all started uh, with the heightened debate around short-termism. And short-termism really goes against the grain of what all Americans are looking for when they think about investing their profits, their savings for the future so that they can have a proper nest egg for retirement. And when you think about short-termism, that goes against everything that they are, they are seeking to achieve, which is long-term growth in the stock market where they invest. And so trying to think about how to get the dialogue back to corporate governance that gears everyone towards the right long-term goals was the, was the goal for this. And, and very importantly, it's the goal for America. You know, there are 28 million companies in America, but there's only 5,000 public companies you can invest in. But those 5,000 public companies, they represent a third of private sector hiring, and they represent half of the CapEx in the United States of America. Mm. And so to get that to be geared towards long-term growth is, is really the goal. And so we, we brought a group of people together starting with the real asset managers that govern and invest in these companies, uh, Vanguard, BlackRock, T. Rowe, Capital Group, J.P. Morgan Asset Management, State Street. And then we gathered together some leading CEOs that we also thought were very important for the dialogue who run great companies. So General Electric, General Motors, Verizon. Right. And then, of course, two of who the people we think are the greatest thought leaders in the United States, Warren Buffett and Jamie Dimon. And together, we had a dialogue around what it means to be good long-term governance for both companies, the boards that oversee the companies, and the shareholders right. that the boards report to. And so what are yeah, those and, kind of things? Yeah. So, and I'm glad you mentioned the asset managers really as the starting point because you are the owners of the companies. The onus is on you, in fact, uh, to, to sort of dictate change and, and, and help CEOs through this. Tell us some of the changes that you're calling for, Mary. Yeah, well, it's not so much change. It's just clarifying the things that we think are most important in corporate governance. So what's the role of the board? The role of the board is to oversee the company and not be beholden to the CEO, to be independent, to meet away from the CEO when you have board meetings, to be able to make sure that the right things are happening in the company, to know management, to have independent thought on the board, to have diversity of thinking, background, experience. Those things are super important for a proper and well-functioning board. What are the right things for the shareholders, the companies like us that oversee the mutual funds that hold these assets? The most important thing is that we're active, that we're there, that we're prodding, that we're poking, that we're making sure that we know that the right things are happening in the company. And very importantly, that we're actively voting on those issues. Now, at J.P. Morgan Asset yeah. Management, we own 10,000 companies around the world. We vote on 100,000 ballot items a year. We meet with about 10 different company management teams or boards of directors on a daily basis. And every time we do that, we're looking for, are you thinking about the shareholder? Are you investing for the long term? Are the right checks and balances in place so that those are the companies that are people who want to invest for the future, for their retirement, are getting the most out of what they can when they put their money to work? Yeah, you make a great point. No board should be beholden to the CEO, and they should have meetings regularly without the CEO present, you write. Diverse boards make better decisions, so make sure the board has complementary, diverse skills, backgrounds, and experiences. And you say companies should not feel obligated to provide earnings guidance. That really speaks to the short-termism uh, and should only be so if they believe that providing such guidance is beneficial to shareholders. All of these things make a lot of sense. Do you need all of the companies to follow it, or are you doing some of this yourself already at J.P. Morgan? 
I mean, it, it very much follows what many of us already do on a daily basis, but we thought it was important that we shared our collective thoughts. When we got together, we had lots of discussion, we had lots of debate, we generally agreed on most things, some things we had small differences on, and, and, the, and the findings are something we thought was important to publish. Publish for those who wanted to see what some of us who we spent a lot of time doing this, this is our, this is our life quest is to get this right for the people that invest and trust us to put their money to work. And so we thought it was best that we share it. it, it they're, not, they're not principles that other people have to share. They're our best practices. They're things that we think should engender a debate, that companies should read that, that boards of directors, people who act as directors on any kind of board should read it and should just think about, are these the kind of questions I'm asking when I'm sitting at the board? Does our board function like this? Are there things we could yeah. be doing to make it better? You, you make great points, Mary. Let me ask you this, because I was having a discussion earlier with Ed Renzi, former CEO of McDonald's USA, and he said, look, if you want to affect growth, and it, it sounds like this is one of the ultimate goals, growth, you also have to deal with regulation, something about Dodd-Frank reform. Um, I know this is sort of apples and oranges. It's not exactly I in the letter, but how do you feel about regulatory reform, and is that needed in order to move the needle on growth, Mary? Well, regulatory reform hits all companies uh, across America and across the world. It just depends on what jurisdiction you're in. And regulations are there to try and make a fair level playing field for people to operate and protect, uh, protect all the constituents as best they can. And so the most important thing is to work within those regulations and to find the way to make sure that the products and services that you're delivering out to the end client are, are the ones that are the best for the client. And the regulators try and help to do that. I think the challenge comes when different regulators have competing issues and or uh, they conflict with one another and or if you're dealing with uh, international markets where you might have uh, local regulations that don't necessarily match with, uh, with your home country regulations. And so those, that's where things can become challenging and you, and you work through them. And I think that you know, regulations can get to a point where if they're not well thought through, they can stymie growth. And so you don't want that. You want very smart regulators to sit with very smart CEOs and think about how do we make good products, good services, and grow so that we mm. can help uh, the economy to continue to, to flourish and, not, and not, to, not to slow down or move backwards.